Okay, so we are at um, the Clean Energy for All Education and Action Series introduction for 2023. Um, joining me tonight uh, is Kelsey Kreps and Sarah Corcoran. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more information about them in just a minute. For the time being, we always like to do a Zoom setup just in case we've somehow forgotten about Zoom, right? Um, so please keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Turn on your video if you're comfortable, but we are recording, so keep that in mind. Uh, it's certainly not mandatory to be on video. Um, if you would like to rename yourself, you can do so by opening the participants list, hovering over your name, clicking the three dots that shows up, and click rename. Feel free to introduce yourself at any time or ask questions in the chat. There will be a Q&A portion um, coming up, so uh, but use the chat in the meantime. Feel free to turn on captions. We do have those running. And then uh, you can also raise your hand if you want to speak when we get to that portion that is also in the participants list. Um, okay, a few community agreements. It's important to us that everyone here is able to participate fully in tonight's sessions. So we do ask that you adhere to some of these following norms. Uh, engage with kindness. All forms of discrimination will not be tolerated speak from your own experience. If you do find yourself speaking a lot, be sure to leave space for others. Stay on mute uh, while our speakers are presenting. As I said, ask questions in the chat. Use the double plus sign in the chat to indicate if something resonates with you. And if you are having technical problems, you can ask for help. Uh, we have other staff here that can support you, can answer those questions if they were to come up. Our speakers are going to try not to use jargon, acronyms, industry language, but do clarify, ask us to clarify if something does not make sense. Our time tonight is tight and limited, so it is possible that we may ask you to continue a conversation that's specific outside of the event. We might not have all of the answers to every question tonight. Uh, in fact, part of this is posing a lot of questions, you will see. Um, so we will follow up with you if there's anything that we can't answer. If you have a question that's unrelated to what we're talking about tonight, please always feel free to reach out to Sierra Club, send us an email, and then approach the ideas we're presenting tonight with an open mind. As I mentioned before, um, my name is Melissa. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I live in Lancaster, land of the Susquehannock. Also joining us tonight is Kelsey Kreps, Senior Campaign Representative with the Beyond Dirty Fuels Campaign. And then our support person this evening is Sarah Corcoran, our Interim Deputy Director of Programs. Uh, so she will watch the chat for you in case you have any questions um, and anything else you may need. I also want to acknowledge the wisdom and talent of others who built the videos and tools that we're going to be exploring today and throughout this series. Nothing that I'm presenting tonight came from me. It's all built on the, the work and labor and um, thoughts of other folks. Uh, so I wanna thank them um, at the outset. Our other contributors today are you. So again, put your name, pronouns, where you're at in the chat at any time. Uh, thank you to Jim Wiley, who I think is here for the idea of making this map of where our participants are located. So if your county is not highlighted on this map, do feel free to let us know in the chat and we will um, resolve that before the recordings of this go out. But I do think I've captured everyone who's here. You're coming from all across the state. Um, so we're one big community here in Sierra Club, Pennsylvania. Here we have our agenda for tonight. I'm not going to go into too much detail with this because it's it's coming right up right now. So let's just move ahead into our series overview. Okay, so you may have attended um, the Clean Energy for All series uh, a few years back. Some of this, our guiding vision, remains the same, but I do want to highlight that as uh, the first piece of the work that we're doing. So the guiding vision here is that we will achieve 100% clean energy in Pennsylvania by contributing to a movement for climate action centered on equity, refra reframing the public vision for energy from one based on extractive fossil fuels to one based on clean energy that is necessary for healthy and safe communities, ensuring political power is in the hands of the people and not dirty industries, 
And then this will lead to state policies that promote investment in clean energy efficiency, sustainable transportation, and building electrification, uh, and phase out the extraction and use of fossil fuels. So that's really our baseline vision, right? The format of this series moving forward. So these are going to be bi-monthly sessions. Save the date for our next one, April 26th. And in each session, we're going to have three components. So there's going to be an educational component. Uh, you're going to hear from speakers from within Sierra, Sierra Club. You're also going to hear from folks in impacted communities, um, other organizations that are working on these energy issues, individual activists that are making change. We're also always going to have an action component, whether that's taking action with Sierra Club, which we hope you'll do, um, but then also action that you can take in support of the communities that are directly affected uh, by the energy issues that we're going to be highlighting. And then there's also a community building component. Um, I know there's a lot of us here, a lot of people registered, we're all across the state, um, but I would love to see people come back and build relationships with each other um, and be you know, the clean energy for all community moving forward as we work together towards shared goals. You're gonna find that some of our sessions may highlight multiple topics that are linked um, where others do a deep dive into a single priority issue. It's just going to kind of depend on the month, what's happening in the state. Today, though, is going to be a little bit different. Um, this session is going to set up how we're going to think about energy issues. It's going to introduce topics that may be featured in future sessions uh, and pose questions about those topics. Questions that we're not going to answer tonight because there's going to be a lot of them coming at you, but they're questions for us to ponder for our future sessions in this series. I want to start with foundations and frameworks. Um, we're going to kind of build what, uh, what is going to be referred to again and again as we move through the specific topics in this series. Um, so I want to ground us in these foundations. The first is environmental justice. So what is environmental justice? There's no single definition. Um, so what I'm sharing here today uh, is a few definitions that have resonated with me. Um, you may have found others that work better for you. And I know that they're applied in different ways in different scenarios and different spaces. Um, I'm going to start with this one from Jill Lindsay Harrison. She uh, wrote the book From the Inside Out, The Fight for Environmental Justice Within Government Agencies. Uh, I recommend it. So Jill proposes looking at environmental justice first uh, by defining environmental injustice. Um, so Jill writes various cultural relations and political economic processes disproportionately situate groups who experience oppression and economic exploitation in environmentally harmful spaces and render them more vulnerable to harm from those hazards. These factors contribute to inequalities in life, opportunity, illness, and death. So then the response to that, environmental justice, those movements fight to redress those inequalities. Um, we are next going to hear from two friends over at the Sierra Club Wisconsin chapter, who back in October 2020 uh, held an event where they posed this question of what is environmental justice um, to various folks working with them. We are just going to hear from two, um, but I will link to this video in the resources that go out, so you're welcome to watch the whole thing uh, if you'd like to hear from more of their, those folks. The ways that climate change intersects with issues of justice, so issues of people's day-to-day -day lived experience and how fair it is in comparison to others. In the context of the climate crisis, I would say it a lot of times is about who is most impacted by the climate crisis at the end of the day. What identities do they fall in? What vulnerabilities are they already coming up against? Environmental racism is the way that the system manifests um, sort of the, is the way that climate change gets manifested in the ways that the system is already unfair in a lot of ways. Looking at environmental justice and environmental racism really um, are useful things to um, you know, start the framework of looking at, at climate change um, in uh, the environment and everything. So first off, like thinking about environmental justice is kind of a, a, a shift 
over the years to this idea of environmental justice as opposed to just like environmentalism or um, just trying to save the environment. And I think that the, to, to me, when I hear environmental justice, what I hear and what um, you know, I've also read about is like really this framework that's based on um, uh, equity and interconnectedness rather than like viewing kind of the environment as something outside of humanity that needs to be saved, but understanding that um, we need to save uh, the environment in order to save ourselves, but also that there are systems um, in place um, that actually perpetuate uh, continued destruction of the environment, but that also means the destruction of, um, of the um, people that live um, within that environment as well. So here we have three different um, kind of ways to think about environmental justice. Um, and so as we move through the Clean Energy for All series, when we're thinking about energy topics, um, we really want to ground ourselves in this concept of environmental justice. So then we have that idea, but how do we start to put it into practice? Uh, so of course, when you're dealing with energy, there's a transition. You're transitioning from dirty fossil fuels to 100% renewable clean energy, right? So it's a process and it's not gonna happen all at once, but what we want to have it be is a just transition. Um, so this concept uh, on the screen here is pulled from Climate Justice Alliance, uh, but then there are also fabulous resources from Movement Generation, um, both of these, uh, links to these organizations are worth looking into, so we will get those to you. Um, but Climate Justice Alliance defines just transition uh, as a vision-led, unifying, and place-based set of principles, processes, and practices that build economic and political power to shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. This means approaching production and consumption cycles holistically and in a waste-free way, this transition itself must be just and equitable, redressing past harms and creating new relationships of power for the future through reparation. If the process of transition is not just, the outcome will never be. So just transition describes both where we're going and how we get there. So what does that look like? Okay, so this graphic is awesome, but I we are not diving into all the pieces of it. So I encourage you to take a look um, at this resource, but I wanted to kind of give you the, the outline of where the Just Transition movement, um, all of the different components of that, right? Um, I totally recommend reading more about it. What I've put on there are kind of our two opposing ends that we're dealing with, right? So dirty fossil fuels are part of an extractive economy, 100% clean renewable energy, uh, ideally is part of a regenerative economy. Um, if we look at the top arc on that screen, it proposes that solutions need to address both aspects. Um, so we need to both focus on stopping the bad as well as creating the new. So that's oppositional and visionary. If we only focus on one aspect, um, we're not going to actually achieve a just transition. I'm going to bump us forward to the bottom arc where it mentions values. Uh, so this comes into play when we're considering just transition. So we started with the idea environmental justice. We want to achieve that, right? But it's a little abstract. So then, okay, we want our transition to live that environmental justice value by being a just transition. Um, but how do we infuse that into the decisions we make? How do we... Um, make sure that when we're deciding whether to support or oppose legislation or whether something's happening in our community, how do we respond to that? Uh, what actions do we take? To ensure just transition, we need values that are gonna filter um, at each step of the way our decision-making process. Um, and so looking into the just transition model, there is an emphasis on establishing our values and returning to them, not just throwing them up at the beginning of, you know, slideshows, presentations, not just referencing them um, because you feel like you have to, but actually going back and thinking about them as you make decisions um, towards change. And that can be hard and that can slow down processes sometimes, but it does lead to a more just transition. So what values are gonna inform our energy work? So we're gonna look at Sierra Club's values. Obviously they may be different than yours. They may overlap, they may not, right? There might be differences, but we're gonna look at Sierra Club's values, um, obviously for the purposes of this Sierra Club presentation. So, whoops, all right. 
Uh, I'm going to start with the Jemez principles for democratic organizing. Sierra Club adopted these in 2014. Uh, we will put the link for the detail of all of these in the chat. So those six values are be inclusive, an emphasis on bottom-up organizing, let people speak for themselves, work together in solidarity and mutuality, build just relationships among ourselves, and a commitment to self-transformation. In addition, Sierra Club established five values that they say are their Sierra Club values. So anti-racism, balance, collaboration, justice, and transformation. Um, they've made a beautiful little video that's one minute long. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that to give you a little bit more context for those values. At the Sierra Club, we believe in the power of together. Together, we will create a world that honors the harmony between our humanity and our planet by abolishing the oppressive systems that deny our right to a healthy, joyful, and sustainable future. We will do this by balancing the urgency of our cause with a commitment to care for ourselves and others and collaborating with like-minded people like you because together we can make a difference. By centering anti-racism because racism harms and divides us all while dismantling the social and economic barriers so we can build communities based on justice. And believing transformation is the ongoing process of working towards equity and justice in ourselves, our actions, and our relationships. Through this journey, we'll transform our Sierra Club community to be part of a powerful movement, a movement to fight for environmental, racial, economic and gender justice. Okay, so this is this is all great, you might be thinking it's a touch academic. Um, but how do we actually apply this to our day to day efforts in a practical way? We want to center environmental justice, we want our transition to be just, um, and we also know what our values are. But how do we actually when a decision is in front of us? How do we think about that? Um, and so I'm going to refer now to the three circles tool, and we're going to le learn a little bit more about that because it's something that we're going to be able to use moving forward. Um, and so that kind of examines real solutions versus false promises. Uh, this lesson was developed by Movement Generation, um, so all credit to them. Um, please check them out and their work and our wonderful presenter here. So I'm going to we're going to get to enjoy here someone else other than me again, um, as Matteo guides us through how to use the three circles tool. I'll take that first circle. So we call this the three circles strategy tool. And we start with this first circle that you see on your screen, which is the realm of what is politically realistic. And a useful starting point is just to recognize that more often than not, especially in the US context, those of us who are organizing to address a structural challenge, an injustice that's playing out in our community, a need that is being unmet, more often than not, when we start wrapping our heads around what to do about it, there is a veiled constraint that already exists in our conversations around it, which is many times, even if we don't name it as such, we limit our thinking within the realms of something that is called politically realistic. And just recognizing that fact and that that's something that is usually imposed on us, uh, even if we're not noticing it, is a valuable um, thing to observe. So I'll take the next slide. And what we are arguing with this exercise, and I think it's part of it, part of the flow of our conversation throughout these weeks is that where we should start any conversation that is trying to address, uh, again, an injustice, a, a problem in our community, is in us having a, a, a very robust conversation. It's like, what is it that we truly need to, to fully fix this issue? What do we need to fully become thriving, healthy communities? And that's what we're calling the realm of real solutions that unless we have this robust conversation and obviously it's iterative and it is continually changing but unless we anchor ourselves in really naming what we know we need uh, we won't actually 
crystallize the work that it takes to get there, right? So that's the green circle. And then there's another circle which is uh, you know, on our screens, if we're looking at the screen on our right-hand side, is, and it's the realm of what we call the false promises. And that is that even as we are articulating what we believe are um, gonna be root cause solutions to any issue we're addressing, there's a whole realm of false promises. There are folks who are really invested in, in, in enclosure, as we've talked about it earlier in, in earlier classes. Um, that will formulate a set of quote unquote solutions as well to problems, you know, climate change is an example. Uh, and we're calling this the realm of false promises. And one of the things that's important to note in this tool is that um, the red and the green never overlap. There, is, there isn't the potential for a real solution of false promise to be one and the same. And we'll notice a couple of other things, right? The, publicly realistic may abut both of the other uh, realms, right? So there might be articulations of what we truly need that already in the popular imagination seem realistic. And similarly, there are false promises that may be deemed politically realistic. And then there's aspects of both the green and the red that live outside of both. So that is kind of the basic premise. So why is this dotted line why, why is politically realistic uh, circle dotted? And that is because it's always fluid. And what do I mean by that? We don't know if something is realistic until we try it. Anybody, right? And as soon as it wins in any realm, it's become realistic, right? So that's one aspect of why it's dotted. But another is it's, it's different in different arenas of struggle. So I'll take the next two slides, Sarah. Some of us may live in New York or California, so we're going to generalize for a second. In, in a blue state, you know, the political realities in this country are such that you know, there's, it's still weighted more towards the red circle. It's a harder still for us to get our ideas to be seen as realistic. But I'll take the next slide. I think we can all probably agree that in, 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 a, in a place like Alabama, it's going to look a lot more like this. That's if we're just doing state by state comparison. But it's not only like state to state. If we compare, say, the federal realm, federal level versus our cities, you know, we often talk about what is possible at the federal level and then think that is true at all levels of governance. But in actuality, more often than not, um, in our cities, towns, and states, there may be way more. I'll take the next slide. You know, it may actually look uh, like this, or may even skew more towards the green. So I'm going to give you. Okay. Um, so when we are looking at um, the uh, three circles tool, there are some questions that can help guide our decision making um, and see whether what we're proposing is a real solution or a false promise. Um, so as we think about these energy issues and we're thinking about solutions to them, um, paths forward, we need to consider is our um, possible action, is it gonna actually make an existing social or envi environmental problem worse? Or is it gonna create a new one? Does it maintain extractive relationships power? Um, if we answer all those, okay, we're in good shape. And then let's think about our real solutions. Does it democratize, decentralize, diversify, uh, reduce consumption or redistribute resources? So these questions can guide um, our decision making and help us locate where our options exist within that three circles. Okay, so Grab a pen and paper. We're going to move through our um, next sections. We're going to do a brief touch on many, many energy topics that may be featured in future sessions, right? And we're going to pose questions that consider how we can infuse justice into each of those topics. So when we mention something that resonates with you, that connects with your experience, if it's a question you've had or a question you've never thought about, uh, something happening in your community, write it down because we're going to come back to this later. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelsey who's gonna walk us through our Beyond Dirty Fuels portion. Take it away, Kelsey. Hey y'all. 
Kelsey Kreps. I use she, her pronouns. I'm based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which is Shawnee Lenape lands. Grew up a lot in Northwestern Pennsylvania, up in between Meadville and Titusville. Um, and I am happy to be here with y'all tonight. Um, so kind of going off of the presentation so far, we've heard about what an environmental justice or an environmental injustice is. We've talked about just transition, but part of that moving into a clean economy involves getting rid of the dirty one. And so that's a lot of what my work is. Um, we can go ahead to the next slide. So what do we can, need to consider when fighting the bad or that extractive economy? What projects do we consider? What do we have to do to win these fights? What do we have to consider in order to have each of these fights be an equitable fight? Um, you know, there are lots of issues that we're all kind of dealing with. How do you decide which ones to work on in your community? And some of the key themes that I think about in the work um, besides some of those key factors and values that we've already discussed is impact, cumulative harm, and misinformation. So that impact, our, what is the climate impact of a particular um, industry, the health and safety problems of that industry, and its impacts on our water or our air emissions and breathing, the radioactivity associated with oil and gas waste, for example, or ecosystem disturbance. Um, I know that these are some of the key impacts that we kind of consider. Cumulative harm. Is this an area that already had a lot of industry? Is this an area that still has a lot of industry? And now a new project is being proposed, but already the community is impacted from emissions from a particular site before it. Um, and that's same thing with multiple sources of local and regional pollution. That environmental justice areas is also something to consider when we consider those systems. So is this a historical area that has been surrounded by industry because of really racist practices that were in place in our communities from times before, like redlining, for example? Um, or are these costs to consumers, that cumulative harm? Have we been going to the doctor more often because we are living next to these facilities? Have we had to get our water tested um, so many more times because of the frack well upstream or the um, or the pipeline that like um, had some issues back in like a creek or something like that. Um, I'm giving very broad examples here, so apologies. But these costs add up and we don't think about them in terms of some of those cumulatively, whether that's our health, our safety, our finances, um, and a variety of others. And misinformation, greenwashing. Industry loves to tell us something is clean when it's not actually clean um, or saying something is renewable when in fact it's not. Um, and I say industry here, meaning more of the oil and gas industry and the ways in which we've seen them market themselves. So that could be claiming benefits um, that they provide to the community, but they aren't com considering the full harms that they are actually causing or internalizing the full costs of their industry because we are as either landowners, taxpayers, people who are living next to these um, facilities or pads or um, wells, or there's some misinformation about choice and claims to being better for costs for consumers. Um, and so wading through the impacts, the cumulative harm and misinformation is a part of some of this work and how we can th think of um, what we need to consider when fighting, the, where we're fighting and how we're fighting. And go to the next slide. And I'm going to breeze through, like super breeze. So bear with me. Some of the key areas of like the work that I've done and where we focused before or where we could focus um, some pieces. And so um, we have a lot of legacy pollution in Pennsylvania. This isn't like we have not been an extractive state for a long time. So we still have issues at play from decades past. Um, and one of those that I work on a lot is orphan wells. And so engaging in these areas that are dealing with orphan wells, um, like with state agencies, utilizing um, federal dollars to plug those wells. We can advocate for those wells to be plugged that uh, include family sustaining jobs, or how do we um, you know, consider the monitoring of wells that have been plugged? I think this is one of the most interesting things to think about in this transition um, aspect of the work is that despite the fact that we could get rid of or, you know, transition into this um, clean and regenerative economy, 
there are still holes in the ground from legacies past that we're going to have to monitor and want to be mindful of. And so that doesn't completely negate the fact that it's there's a monitoring aspect of legacy pollution as well. So considering that for your community um, or, or the history of your community and the history of that um, within your particular um, county. We can go ahead and so accountability. Um, so I think accountability includes how oil and gas here has um, passed the buck on the communities and taxpayers. So by exceeding emissions on permits, they don't report data correctly, if at all, at times, uh, and overinflating production values. Particularly here, I would love to point out there was a recent DEP report, um, Department of Environmental Protection report, that highlighted the culture of non-compliance for the conventional industry, which is the shallow gas industry. So um, I think that report is really helpful in understanding just like how sometimes what we're dealing with and who we're dealing with currently in the game um, needs some accountability measures and watchdogging. Um, some of those are also talking about assessing penalties and exceedances. So anyone who has seen the Eyes on Shell campaign, you know, Shell has been operating for um, within the 100 days. We're coming up on 100 days of them operating over in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, and already they've exceeded those permits. So these are kinds of the situations where watchdogging and accountability measures um, come into play. And I can make sure to link that um, campaign and get folks more involved there if they'd like to. Um, we can go on. We can stop proposed projects. So there's the dealing with legacy issues of our past. There is the accountability of folks that we're dealing with. And then there's the stopping of proposed projects. And so I have a couple of things here, but most of the time that kind of comes into play. How can we stop the permits of facilities like pipelines or liquefaction facilities? Anybody coming up from Northeastern Pennsylvania, we were working on fighting back the Y losing liquefaction facility. Um, there is pipelines listed here for different examples, but how do these impact um, interacts with legacy pollution and cumulative harm? For example, if a if a if a new well for a frack well is being drilled in an area where abandoned or orphaned wells are are at that they don't necessarily know about, you can cause a lot of problems. And so we kind of think about these things on top of each other. So a proposed project, okay, what is that area in? Who's already impacted by industry in that area? Why would we want to stop that project versus other projects versus et cetera? And so, and who who is harmed in the process of here? Who needs to be held accountable? Who, and I'm listing a whole bunch of questions here, but these are what we consider when we're fighting things in our own communities or across the state. We can go to the next slide. Ah, one of uh, the big ones is also stopping giving money. <laughs> giving our money in tax breaks and subsidies for gas and gas related projects. We can't get to a clean economy if we keep giving folks handouts. Um, so uh, this is a, an example of a picture when uh, for a Harrisburg rally pre COVID, um, literally like three days pre COVID. Also, this was my last day uh, um, on a different at a different job. Um, but so yeah, literally like week of shutdowns. Um, we were all in Harrisburg asking for the state legislature not to vote on a bill that was going to give tax credits to um, petrochemical industry, which is a gas related project. Um, so utilizing Pennsylvania gas, expanding the gas industry and promotion, promoting that fighting subsidies and fighting like bad budgets is also a really big part of that process. And I'm really grateful for the staff that we have in Harrisburg who do a lot of that work. Um, but it is a piece of the puzzle for sure. And then one of the other last like kinds of things to consider is the transport and export of this. Um, stopping gas for export, more gas for export means more fracking and more transportation of hazardous materials around the world. And who benefits from that export of gas? A lot of the times it's not happening for Pennsylvanians who are dealing with the actual impacts of the frack well that's in their neighborhood or in their communities or how is their, their areas are being used for as a quote unquote sacrifice zone to be shipped for profit by bigger industries who are not paying their workers well or not, you know, the folks in the community are not seeing the full aspects of I am, that was a terrible sentence, apologies y'all. Um, so, but what areas are being considered as for sacrifice zones for the quote unquote economy? 
what misinformation is being spread about the benefits to local communities and who is circulating that information. A lot of times right lately I've been hearing, oh, we need to expand these particular gas projects because that will make our gas bills cheaper or our, our own energy bills cheaper. And that's not true. So a lot of that kind of pieces of the puzzle is kind of coming back to that misinformation theme that I talked about earlier. There's a lot of that out there and wading through that can get to be really tiresome, but that's part of the work. Um, and what are the climate impacts of these projects? You know, taking something from the ground to a larger facility, and this map here is showing the path from the wild losing liquefaction facility down to the Gibbs Gibbstown Export Facility um, in New Jersey. So this was a project, this is a project that's talking about transporting LNG, which is liquefied natural gas, to from a facility across land by truck and train through then the suburbs of um, Philadelphia into Gibbstown for export. And so first and foremost, this idea of transport is really dangerous in general. LNG is an inextinguishable um, material. And um, so not only are we dealing with the fact that it's a safety hazard to who and how, what are the safety measures in place? How do we create systems that deal with terms of disaster? How do we have, how do we deal with the climate impacts of these projects then from well, well pad to facility to transport to shipping to where it's going. And so I think that a lot of these kinds of things, we think about climate impacts of like one particular facility, but how that facility plays its role into the whole chain is also really important. So if you can break um, down that chain, it can push back on some of this, um, the bad economy and fighting the bad, and we can kind of win and promote then faster transitions into what I will turn back over to Melissa to talk about um, for the 100% um, clean energy. We are going to look now at um, some questions related to the transition from beyond dirty fuels to 100% clean energy. How do we make this transition? Um, and now I want to say that we are mentioning lots of topics that you may not have heard about or you don't have a lot of background in. No worries. We don't expect everyone to come into this having all of this knowledge, right? In some ways, we are breaking our own rule by, by using some industry information and, and jargon. Um, but as we move through the Clean Energy for All series sessions, you will get that education uh, in these topics that we're mentioning. Um, so for clean energy, we want to consider, much like as Kelsey presented, for dirty fuels, accessibility, affordability, and misinformation. Um, how do we make clean energies accessible to everyone? How do we communicate and conduct outreach about opportunities to transition to clean energy? Uh, how do we make it affordable? How do we model equity, not just equality, and how clean energy subsidies and other benefits are distributed? How do we combat misinformation? You know, how do we look at who's promoting those falsehoods and why they're promoting them? And then how do we also center and care for those whose fears are reflected and exploited by those myth makers, right? So folks that right now believe these pieces of misinformation, um, there's a reason that they have those fears about clean energy and we wanna center and care for them as well, uh, or we're not gonna succeed at a just transition. Um, so I'm gonna fly through some topics. Again, these are questions we're posing for future series. So of course, we're gonna look at clean renewable energies. We're gonna ask questions like, how do we make these energies accessible and affordable? How are sites selected for solar and wind placement? Who is impacted by that site selection? Uh, some lawmakers have expressed uh, concerns that these sites need to have bonding, um, which again, we will touch on in future series uh, as, in the same way that oil and gas wells do. Who are those lawmakers and why are they making that argument? What resources, training and support are needed to remove barriers to entry for clean energy jobs? Well, we, there's constraints on clean energy in Pennsylvania. There are regulations, legislation in Pennsylvania that are in our way when it comes to this transition. Um, and a lot of those constraints are promoted uh, to the public under the guise of supposedly protecting choice, but it's actually seeking to maintain the supremacy of fossil fuels. So we're gonna ask questions like, what role can community solar play in making solar an energy source for everyone? Um, so my home is not eligible for solar panels, but if it was legal, 
in Pennsylvania and accessible. Um, I would love to buy into a community solar um, project in my community. Uh, how can we work to expand community choice aggregation beyond the current restrictions? Um, again, I'm using terms you may not be familiar with, but we will dive into this as will our other um, conservation teams. Uh, how do we fend off preemption legislation? Uh, legislation that essentially prevents communities from taking action at the local level uh, on climate uh, and limiting carbon. So legislation that says things like communities can't restrict which utilities can be um, put into new buildings, uh, that type of thing. So there's a lot of constraints that we're working within and then we need to question. Clean buildings. So no matter where we you know, live, work, learn, play, we want clean energy powering those spaces. So we're gonna ask, how can we weatherize, retrofit existing buildings to maximize their energy efficiency and limit their energy consumption? Same thing goes with electrifying appliances, homes. How can we make these updates affordable and accessible? Again, we're gonna keep returning to that. And how can we can make, make sure that benefits are directed um, towards these renovations for folks who need it most? Uh, are resources, language resources available to help people who are non-English speakers navigate these systems and other accessibility issues like that, right? The benefit might be there, but if you don't know it's there and no one helps you get it, that's not really justice. Clean transportation, whether it's personal, public, uh, or if, you know, packages arriving at our door or a mail coming to us. How can we make these vehicles accessible and affordable for everyone? Uh, or electric vehicles, where is charging infrastructure located and supported? How can we electrify government fleets, the shipping industry? We need to question if public transportation is truly accessible, affordable, and a reasonable uh, alternative for folks. If, if they have to walk 25 minutes to the bus, that's not as uh, easy as jumping in a car, right? And how can people-powered transportation, even things like biking, walking, be made affordable and safe? Uh, if you don't have great sidewalks or you have no sidewalks at all, it's kind of hard to, you know, walk somewhere safely. If you have a wheelchair, that's difficult. Um, bikes can be ex expensive and dangerous depending where you live. So these are all justice questions. And that brings us to hydrogen, which it's complicated. Um, so I do have um, some quote there from Kara Badaroff, a managing senior analyst with Sierra Club. I won't read it all to you now, but again, these slides are coming out. So I encourage you to go back and read through all of these details after you receive these resources. So we are going to ask the questions, how clean are proposed hydrogen projects really? Who's promoting a project and why? And where will those hydrogen hubs, those networks be located? How will those communities be affected? If you're interested in all things hydrogen, like I am, and it's complicated nature, um, our next session on April 26th is going to focus exclusively on hydrogen. Um, so we are going to dive right into that topic with some great speakers. Uh, so that registration for that is open now. So you can sign up right away tonight. Okay, so building our CEFA community. We are going to do real quick breakout rooms. Um, you wrote down some notes. When you go into your breakout rooms, introduce yourself quick. Consider any of these prompts. How are you or someone you know affected by any of the is energy issues we presented? Again, if you're not familiar with the details of them, no problem. How is your community in general impacted by energy issues? What do you hope will change? And what brought you here tonight? Um, any of these things can be brought up in your breakout room. Sometimes we all need a break from the screen. So when you go into your breakout room, if you do not want to do this, just stay on mute, uh, keep your camera off, you don't need to speak, or you can go ahead and come back to the main room um, and have a little break from the screen times. Okay, so what we've created is an opportunity for you to share your energy story at any time. So, um, why are we doing this? It's going to help guide which topics and speakers we feature in future sessions. It's going to inform our campaigns, right? If something's happening in your community, it's great to hear about it, whether it's good or bad. It will amplify the good work taking place at the local level, uh, especially if there is an amazing organization or an activist that you want to see highlighted. We have a platform here to um, let them share their stories, uh, their experiences, and their good work with the whole state, right? And we want to build our relationships with each other. 
So we're going to put a link to this form in the chat, uh, like we always do. It's going to be open anytime. There's no rules to what you write, but we would love to hear from you. You can answer any of the prompts on there or just write freely. Uh, there is an opt-in button if you are okay with having your story featured on social media or at a future event. Uh, if you're interested in speaking, you can consent to that. Otherwise, feel free to remain anonymous. Um, so that is the initial step in our community building process with these calls. Move to our next, our last section, taking action. Okay, so in addition to hopefully submitting some of your thoughts into our energy story bank, I also hope you will register for our next session, uh, April 26th, like I said, all things hydrogen. Um, the link is going in the chat. We also have conservation teams. So we have a dirty energy conservation team and a clean energy conference conservation team. These are led by volunteers. Uh, they dive uh, into all of these issues in Pennsylvania, and they also plan some really excellent webinars, right? So if you really want to get into the details of these topics, I highly recommend their webinars. Uh, the schedules are there. We're going to put the link to the all activity schedule the calendar for Sierra Club Pennsylvania, where you can sign up for any or all of these meetings or webinars. We also have a grassroots power building team. Uh, so this is a great place to connect with other activists and learn about ways to take action. There's a lot of writing letters to the editor, phone banking. There is also a storytelling workshop com coming up in March that is sponsored by the volunteer lobbying team. Um, so you don't need to be part of that team to come to this. Interested in what Kelsey is doing? Ready to roll up your sleeves and get dirty with orphaned and abandoned wells? Uh, you can join her work by sending her an email and she will get you connected to the um, Beyond Dirty Fuels team, orphaned and abandoned well advocacy. If you like writing letters to the editor, there is an opportunity for you to take action now to fight for clean energy. Um, your words matter to your community and to Governor Shapiro's administration. So if you are interested in writing some letters in support of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, if you don't know what that is and you just want to learn more, um, send me an email and I'll get you connected with those resources. And then Randy Francisco couldn't be here tonight. He's a senior organizer, but he put together these two slides. Uh, he is currently collecting comments um, about EPA um, rules, air pollution rules. So the EPA recently took steps to update standards, but they fell short of what is needed. So Randy is collecting comments. If you would like to participate in that, you would send him an email. And then he also has many other ways to get involved that are very small on this screen, but you will see it in more detail when it comes out in your emailed resources. So he has uh, ways you can get involved by submitting a comment online, posting on social media, or writing a letter to the editor about these air pollution rules. Um, so you'll want to connect with Brandy if that is of interest to you. Finally, we have a Zoom poll, and then we're going to, um, while that is running, we're going to go ahead and take your questions. Um, so our this was Valentine's themed. It's the day after Valentine's. I hope you all had a nice one. Uh, but we're asking, are you ready to make a commitment? Where are you sending your clean energy Valentine? So of all the ways that we mentioned tonight for you to take that next step, we want to hear from you. Um, click into the poll all the ways that you think you're going to take action after this session. Uh, and while that's running again, we will go ahead and open the floor for questions.